Welcome to Manufacturing Talk Radio. Welcome everyone to this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. We're joined by Dr. Chris Keel, who is our favorite economist of all the economists that are out there. So Lou and I have a great time talking with him because he actually has a humorous view of what's going on in the U.S. and the world economies. Chris, thanks for or, joining us. Well, thank or you very not, much. I'm, or not going on. Exactly. I'm, I'm always reminded when I'm introduced that way of what we did to my granddaughter for years. We would tell her, you're my favorite granddaughter. And I think she was like 27 before she realized she was our only granddaughter. Um, <laughs> and and so I, I'm your favorite economist of the one economist I know, huh? So anyway. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm watching the government GDP numbers, as yes. are you. And I'm not quite sure, Chris, are they reporting the nominal number or the new real GDP number or whatever they're using? Yeah, they're still doing the same system that they've always had. It's still a kind of a, a three-part process. I mean, what we've seen is what they call the first stage or the initial GDP report, and it gets revised two more times. So we won't have final GDP numbers probably until December for third quarter. They don't change a whole lot from one iteration to the other, but you can sometimes get, I don't know, half a point, even sometimes a full point difference between their, because it depends on the data. They're trying to compute how much stuff we produce, and that is the easy part. What's challenging is figuring out the service side. You know, how much are we making when it comes to service? Because service is a lot more fuzzy. You know, it's like, it's real easy to say, hey, we made that thing that's produced, but, you know, how do you value the blathering of an attorney? <laughs> so. <laughs> With little value. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, they, the old joke of, which is used for so many professions, including economists. What do you call two economists at the bottom of a pool? A at start. Beginning. Yeah. At right. beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, so what was the GDP number? And is and I'm sure it was right on forecast. No, oh, yeah, it was. It was just, you know, we were, we were only off by about five points. Um, so... We were thinking maybe 1%. There were those that were calling for an actual downturn. And instead, we get 4.9. And it was not a complete surprise because we had been watching retail numbers that were defying gravity. I mean, we were seeing a lot, a lot more retail activity than we thought we would see. Again, not terribly surprising. This is the time of year that people start spending, but Halloween came in very strong. Halloween is now the second largest spending holiday in the U.S. calendar. This was the fifth year in a row that adult costumes outsold children's, <laughs> and it is now an adult holiday. It's a decorating holiday, and it kind of sets up the holiday season, so there's there's happiness among retailers the only hesitation is that they were planning a more mediocre year so they don't have as much stock um this is likely to be one of those years where men in particular are going to panic the last two weeks of december because it'll suddenly occur to us that we have to buy something for christmas and there's going to be nothing left but i don't know used chewing gum um and we're like where is everything well we sold it all out you slackers buy early and buy often <laughs> that's it that's it you know <clears throat> like you know old I, chicago politics vote early and vote often so you know what i found interesting last night in the uh new jersey business magazine which i don't know must have been about five pages long uh they one of the articles was about the pending recession and the list of the top 10 companies in New Jersey that are laying off and have submitted 
uh, cancellation notices to the Labor Department mm-hmm. that they are laying off people in New Jersey. And these right. are these are the, the drug companies, uh, uh, Comqual, Com, Comcal, uh, uh, Pfizer. Um, I can't remember them all. That so it was rather impactful and insightful that all of a sudden they're laying off these people. However. The article did bring out they laid off 50 people, they laid off 18 people. <laughs> this one laid off 100 people. You know, we got what, six, seven million people working in New Jersey, and they're talking about 189 people they laid off. And that right. made an article in this New Jersey business rag sheet. That's why I'm not using the name. But they still think the recession's coming. Or yeah, there's there's a awful lot of this kind of overblowing the connections. I mean, because well, for example, what we saw about a year ago, a lot of the high tech companies were laying people off, and it was all over the national press and it's Oracle and Microsoft and Amazon and all this stuff. What they didn't point out was that those people were almost immediately snapped up by other companies that the people who were laid off by Oracle, for example, they were without a job for eight hours. And then they were hired by somebody else because the demand for the high tech skills was still there. Companies frequently sort of hire on spec. Um, They anticipate something happening I used to work for years and years ago, a marketing company. Well, when you were bidding for a marketing gig, you had to have the capacity to do the job you were bidding for immediately, but you didn't know you were going to get it. And if for some reason you didn't get it, well, then you turn to the people that you just hired and you laid them off because it's like, well, we would have needed you if we had gotten the job, but we didn't. So see ya. And a lot of of companies are kind of forced to do that because if they get a job, they've got to be ready to do it right away. And the other thing we're running into with sort of the layoff environment is that companies are increasingly turning to technology, robotics, automation. And if they have set about to modernize a certain part of their operation, well, then suddenly everybody who was in that sector gets a pink slip. Because it's like, well, we're still growing, we're still, but we're now doing it with robots, and we don't need you guys. So it's word to the wise: if you see a robot coming into your facility, hit it with a hammer. The Luddites did this back in Scotland at one point and attacked all the looms, and it worked for a while, you know. So that's right. Christmas has this had any? real impact on employment we've heard about in the news like everybody's gonna lose their job and but i don't not, know not that the figures i mean we're still looking at 3.8 percent unemployment we're still facing more of a worker shortage than we are unemployment i mean the number of of companies that are striving to hire it's it's never been higher you know the big complaint every single conference i go to when i ask what's the number one concern worker shortage we cannot find the people we need and it's usually a mismatch i mean it's not that there aren't people out looking for jobs but they don't have the skills that are needed by the companies that are hiring and the companies that are hiring are mostly turning to poaching to fulfill their needs they're going after each other's employees so we are not yet seeing a a decline in opportunity we are seeing a lot more mismatching We're recognizing that people are going to be migrating more, uh, moving from one part of the country to another where the opportunities may be greater. I mean, that's one of the things that's affecting the West Coast and the Northeast is that companies are moving out of those areas because of the cost of operations and taxes and all the other considerations. So there's layoffs in California and there's layoffs in the Northeast. Meanwhile, they can't find enough people in Texas or Arizona or Tennessee or any place, North Carolina, which is booming like crazy and desperately trying to find people to move there. Have you have you heard of the following? Because we have and we've been experiencing it. We have been trying to hire 
people in two departments of our company of all metals and forge group. 60% of the people that agree to come to an interview don't show. Mm -hmm. Yep, we're seeing a lot of that. And part of that is related to kind of the rules and regulations about getting unemployment insurance that you have to go through a process you have to be actively looking for work <clears throat> which means you apply for things and then you file it and said hey i applied for a job at all metals and forge okay well technically you applied for a job did you show up for the interview no did you send a resume no do you have any idea what that company does no do you know why lou wears a yellow coat no but you've served, you know, you sent in the paperwork. So according to the local office, oh, you're actively looking for work. No, they're not. Yeah, terrible. So, Chris, we have had millions of people come across our southern border into the U.S., largely unskilled. What are we going to do with them? Yeah, and the trouble with immigration right now is that we've never seen fewer people coming from Mexico than we are right now because Mexico is growing. It's got 5.4% growth right now. Manufacturing has taken over as Mexico's primary source of money. Uh, they used to ship us a lot of oil and agriculture. Now it's 90% manufacturing. The people that we're getting are from Central America, from Latin America. We've had about four or five million Venezuelans alone. And the challenge is that not only are they, in many cases, unskilled, they don't want to be here. They're being chased out of the country they're originating in. I mean, just a silly anecdotal story. Trying to get something fixed with my sprinkler system, and I see a guy up the street that's putting in a sprinkler system. So I walk up to him and see if he can help me. And notice he has a very heavy accent, but very good English. And I said, So, what are you doing here? He says, I'm Venezuelan. I'm working illegally. I was an accountant in Caracas, but then I made the mistake of calling Maduro a horse's patootie and I got put on a death list, and I had to get my family out of Caracas before they killed us. My client had a friend in your city. Therefore, I came to Kansas City illegally, and I'm putting in a sprinkler system, and I'm an accountant. So, A, don't ask me any questions, because I don't know the first damn thing about sprinkler systems. And B, if anybody would pick off that jerk, I would go back home tomorrow. And he said, so the other four million of us. So what we've had in the past were immigrants that wanted to relocate and stay here and work here. Now what we have are refugees who are like, yeah, we're going to stay here until somebody offs Nicolas Maduro or whatever drug thug is running the city that I'm in from Honduras or, or wherever else in that. And so it's a different group. Um, the Mexican immigrant, well, they're finding jobs in the northern part of Mexico. Mexico now has as big a problem with immigration as we do because they're coming in from the Central America and the Mexicans are literally herding them north. I was talking to a guy in the border patrol that said, yeah, they're trying to be helpful. They're sitting on the other side of the border going, they're from Guatemala, just a heads up. So... So why is it that Mexico is not blocking their border? They're trying to. Oh, we don't and, hear about it. Yeah, they are very definitely trying to block that southern border. But when you look at, at Mexico, that part of Mexico is jungle. And, and it is very easy to sort of slip through and find trails. And, you know, they just don't have the resources. They've, they've tripled the number of military that they have on the border trying to stop the migration. But, you know, it's it's <clears throat> smuggling drugs and smuggling people is surprisingly easy. Well, they could build a wall, but they spent too much money building ours. Yeah, that's true. Um, you know, it's like I'm I'm kind of thinking that maybe they could just, you know, simplify it. They could make, make it more like a, a decorative fence. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so some some chain link picket picket fence would be good. So, yeah, 
So what does this do for the U.S. economy, either up or down, as we it, try to work with refugees? Yeah, it it is it's a drain because we don't really know what what to do. We don't even investing in training is not necessarily the answer because if they don't plan to stay here, then you're not going to get the benefit of, I mean, Europe is having the same problem with Ukrainians that have been fleeing the war. They don't want to stay in Europe either. They want to go home. At some point, we're going to have to look at, at sources of skilled immigration. And that is largely in the future going to be Africa. Africa has the youngest population in the world, something like 60% of Africans are under the age of 30. And many of them are educated. And we're beginning to see <clears throat> different sectors. We've seen it for years in the medical sector, but we're now seeing it in, in other areas because they've been educated, they've been trained, but now they're trying to find a job and Africa doesn't have enough jobs. So you start running into uh, engineers and the like. It's like, where are you from? Ghana, Nigeria, Botswana. I got educated, but there's no jobs in my country, so I'm here. Is that why China is now building manufacturing in in Africa? Absolutely. I mean, they're they're sort of facing the. They've got one of two things: they can either educate their own population, which is most of the rural areas are not very well educated, or they move to someplace else, and that's often Africa. And they also like to get engaged in countries where there's commodities to be purchased. So they're interested in places like Nigeria because Nigeria has oil. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and they're digging up as much coal in China as they can dig up. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, that's the weakness that China's already had because it's oil is non-existent. It doesn't produce much. And it's coal is high sulfur brown coal. Most of the coal that we produce in this country, we sell to China. Oh, well, it's uh, it's interesting to watch all of the noise being made about electric cars and mm -hmm. green technology here in the U.S. I'm guessing, Chris, that we're the greenest country on the planet. Well, no, the, the most of the green activity has been in Europe. Um, they have made more of a commitment, but they're also running into the inevitable problems that we're running into, you know, a lot of the green technology in Europe has succeeded because it's been heavily subsidized. And when that subsidy begins to run out, then the economics don't make sense. And the Germans are running into that now. China is investing a lot of money into EVs and solar and, and that kind of stuff. But again, it's heavily subsidized. And that's always been the problem here. You're starting to see investors back away from alternatives because the equations aren't working out if those subsidies disappear. And as people look ahead at the election, they said, look, if for some reason Congress goes entirely Republican, if we have a Republican president, a lot of those green initiatives may stall. And if those subsidies disappear, then it's going to be difficult to justify the investment in in alternative. You've already started to see companies slow down. One of the largest producers of offshore wind has backed out of two projects already, saying, yeah, it doesn't work economically. We can't do this. And EVs, people are beginning to realize that the big threat is likely to be a few years down the road when you have a lot of high mileage EVs, which normally would sell cheap because it's a high mileage used car, but an EV with that kind of mileage on it needs a new battery. And somebody buying a bargain used car is not about to buy a car that needs a $12,000 battery. So the car dealers are like, ooh, we're going to get stuck with a lot of high mileage EVs that we can't sell. There's um, tidal technology or wave technology. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be up in the North Sea, mm -hmm. Norway, Sweden, and so on. And uh, it's working very efficiently and very yeah. well. Uh, I think it's either Norway or Sweden that 20% of their electricity mm -hmm. is coming from 
these underwater mm-hmm. turbines that are hooked up like a train. Mm-hmm. Waves come along and do do da do da do and make a lot of electricity. Right. Um, the United States has a very long coastline. Yes, it does. On both sides of our uh, country. And south. Leave us not forget the Gulf of Mexico. (laughs) And south, which sometimes is hit with hurricanes. But we could be generating more electricity for the East Coast and West Coast than we would know what to do with, other than the fact that the oil companies might have something nasty to say about it. Well, and the oil companies, for the most part, have been reinventing themselves as energy companies. So when you start to look at where the investment's coming from, it's frequently the oil companies who are saying, hey, you know, at some point when things switch over from oil and gas, well, we want to be in there. We want to be the solar producers and tidal producers and the like. And it's essentially the same idea behind hydroelectric. I mean, that's where power came from for years was you'd create a dam, you run water past the dam, you create electricity. And I think the primary hangup on a lot of the title, because the Europeans went through this too, early on when they were coming up with this stuff, you had lots of protections for the coastline. And those had to be changed to say, hey, this is okay. If we put in these turbines, it's not going to mess up the coastline. It's not, because that's the problem with the offshore wind is that people are like, well, the coasts are protected these turbines create problems for the marine life and it's visually unappealing, et cetera. And then the Europeans would say, yeah, the tidal stuff doesn't have those same problems. And right. so they're <clears throat> beginning to make some inroads here too. And, and saying that, yeah, we understand you want to keep the coasts what they are. The, the most opposition thus far, both in Europe and here has come from the fishing interests who are saying it's going to mess up the fishing grounds and there are ways to keep that from being a major problem so there was an interesting turbine built in the east river of manhattan Mm -hmm. back uh, 10 years ago and it was an underground underwater turbine Mm -hmm. they put one down there and they said well let's try this out as a Mm -hmm. and the river is a fast moving river oh yeah because of its geographic location. And all of a sudden, one day, it just stopped running. So they pulled it up, and it was just beat to crap. <laughs> Telephone poles, <laughs> and cars were, underwater cars were banging. Oh, yeah. It came up and was not repairable. Right. So the Hudson River is not a good place. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's it's... All of these things the Europeans have run into periodically where, you know, you'll get one of those dandy North Sea storms and it's like, oh, God, we weren't ready for this. Um, I mean, you see that in some of the technologies. Kansas was investing heavily in wind power. And but somebody finally pointed out to them that if the wind is blowing over 35 miles an hour, these things shake themselves to death. (laughs) And anyone who lives in Kansas knows, yeah, it blows a lot harder than 35 miles an hour most of the year <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you don't mind having a a wind turbine blade launching through your garage um you're you know it's a good idea because i'm watching with interest 2d materials graphene being the mm-hmm. most uh, <laughs> the one that gets the most attention at the moment and i'm wondering what happens in the energy sector when they figure out how to collect solar power with a panel that's two microns thick Mm -hmm. yeah i mean the technology has to keep advancing and and all the sort of geopolitical issues china has had kind of a lock on some of the alternative technologies because they have more of the rare earth minerals that the the sector needs we have rare earths in the united states we have as much as china does but extracting it is very expensive and and environmentally challenging. The Chinese don't have a lot of problems with strip mining to get a little bit of rare earth. We do. And 
so we're very dependent on China still for some of those things. I mean, there was a big to do a few months ago over the supplies of germanium, um, which basically are critical for batteries. Most of that comes from China. Lithium is something else that we don't produce much of ourselves. And we get it from places like China and Bolivia, which is just terribly stable. You know, it's like it's 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 great to work with a country that periodically says, well, we don't really have a leader. Um, so we'll we'll figure that out later. Yeah, great stuff. Well, Maybe that's the answer to all the geopolitical problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't have a leader. Exactly. <laughs> or, or or just pick them at random to, you know, I'm convinced that if, if we really wanted things to change, we would go find a phone book. There's got to be one somewhere. Throw a dart and whoever it hits gets to be the new senator or representative. You know, it's like, Hiram Higginbotham, you're the new guy. You could not possibly do any worse than the last guy so. <laughs> seems reasonable yeah Stad sadly true for our entire government yeah well chris we appreciate you being with us it's always fun to chat with you uh, you add a little levity to serious subjects and geez you know a lot so <laughs> well there you go <laughs> it's like if i had a life you know i wouldn't know all this stuff but you know it's just my my goal in life is just to be deadly at trivia games. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for reporting from Orlando. Uh, yes. We'll talk to you again next month. Very good. Thank you, guys. And to all, all of our audience, if you like the show, if you like Dr. Chris here, click on the like button, the subscribe button, the share button. We appreciate it. We got to get our numbers up. Because we are right now, according to one poll, we are number 10 out of 1,000 manufacturing podcasts. We're Perfect. going for number one. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it's absolutely no fun to go to a, a meeting and chant, we're number nine. We're number nine. Yeah, that's just... <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> okay, so we're shooting for one. So click it. Click us the button. And thanks, thanks, for, thanks for joining us on this episode of Manufacturing Talk Radio. Thanks. That's our show for today. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please like and subscribe, share on social media, or leave a review. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Rumble, or your favorite podcast app. Visit us online at mfgtalkradio.com for our other episodes. We have also included links to our advertisers below. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.